So people like to masturbate. <laughs> they also like to eat Twinkies and do shots of Jägermeister. Not typically all at the same time, but <laughs> if you had a rough week, no one's going to judge. Um, what these otherwise disparate pleasures have in common is that from a scientific perspective, we've been told they're all evolutionary mistakes. So let's talk about masturbation. The orgasm is the best thing that can happen to you. Right? Evolution is reserving its biggest carrot, its biggest reward for the behavior that it wants to reward the most, which is putting genes into the next generation. So this is tip the, the adaptive target of the orgasm is reproductive sex. Human beings being very clever primates have figured out we can get this reward other ways. Right? <laughs> so this is a classic case of a brain hijack. So this is one type of evolutionary mistake where you are getting a reward that you're not supposed to get. You're, you're getting a reward. You're figuring out a way to trigger a reward circuit that shouldn't be triggered in the situation you're in. Evolution designed this very powerful uh, positive reinforcement device. And human beings have figured out how to game the system, and other animals as well, like little rats pushing a lever to get cocaine <laughs> injections. Evolution's probably kind of pissed off about this, but it, it's not going to bother with it very much because masturbation is a pretty low cost behavior. It's low cost, and it's also really not interfering at the end of the day with the main objective. We're still doing plenty of reproductive sex. Twinkies, junk food in general, is a different type of evolutionary mistake. I'm going to call this an evolutionary mismatch. So this is a case where there was an adaptive target, but it doesn't apply anymore. So for most of our evolutionary history, we, food was a problem. Acquiring enough food was a problem, especially sweet things and proteins, fatty types of things, were a very patchy resource. So you get a lot of it all at once, and then you get nothing for a long time. So individuals who had a sweet tooth and who liked fat and who would gorge on this stuff when they had it had an advantage. This is a very adaptive trait. And for most of our evolutionary history, evolution is not going to care, not really be able to deal with this at all, because it's a very recent problem. And it's still pretty localized. So there's lots of places in the world where getting enough calories is still a challenge. So evolution is not going to worry about this mismatch problem too much in the case of junk food. Now, when it comes to alcohol, the Jägermeister shots, we've been told the standard story is that it's a brain hijack. That's the most dominant scientific theory about why we have a taste for alcohol. We figured out that consuming ethanol triggers this reward network in our brain. And like that little rat pushing the lever, we just keep doing it. That's the standard story. There are also various mismatch theories floating around out there. That taste for alcohol allowed us to consume liquid in a safe form when uh, water was contaminated. There are se several different mismatch theories. What I want to argue tonight is none of these make sense. None of these can actually be an explanation for an evolutionary explanation for why we have a taste for alcohol. And that's because our taste for intoxication is ancient, costly, and dangerous. As, as long as we've had writing, People have been complaining about the dangers of alcohol, the dangers of alcoholism, the dangers of social chaos caused by excessive consumption. We find this in ancient Egypt, ancient China. In ancient Sumer, it's estimated that half the grain production went to producing beer. So they're taking half of their food and turning it into liquid neurotoxins. And as you notice, you know, kings had to decree that their subjects weren't allowed to make more beer than a certain amount because people want to turn it into beer. So very costly in terms of social consequences and also just uh, materially costly, economically costly. It's estimated that today most households spend about a third of their food and beverage budget on alcohol. And that's almost certainly an underestimate because of black markets and underreporting. Um, and you may have not gotten the memo yet about masturbation. It doesn't make you go blind. <laughs> Don't worry about it. What does make you go blind is alcohol. Um, shots of Jägermeister can make you go blind. So it's very, alcohol is very damaging physiologically. It causes liver damage. It raises your cancer risk. From a medical perspective, there's really no upside to alcohol. And you can forget about all this the French paradox cholesterol stuff. It's, <laughs> it's bad for you. From a biomedical perspective, alcohol is bad for you. It's a dangerous substance. 
in the tiny country that I live in now, about the size of, of uh, California, 2014 is estimated that the economic impact of alcohol abuse was $14.6 billion. That's probably Canadian dollars. So that's like $10 US, but it's still a lot of money. Um, 14,800 deaths, 8,700 hospital admissions, all these years of productive life lost. This is a, if this is an evolutionary mistake, it's an incredibly costly evolutionary mistake. It's, it doesn't make sense that there would not be some pressure to fix this if all it was was a cost. Now, sometimes it is the case that evolution can't fix something. So evolution is constrained by certain conditions. So evolution can't act on a variant that doesn't exist. Selection pressure can't select for a genetic variation that isn't out in the world yet. So it's possible that our uh, taste for alcohol is a mistake. It's a very costly, ancient, dangerous one. But genetic evolution just hasn't churned out a variant yet that would fix the problem. That's one possibility. There are also various types of what's called path dependence, where evolution makes one decision, and then it's kind of stuck. It has to keep going down that path. So that could be part of the story, too. It's not. <laughs> Neither of those is possible in this case, because there are genetic and cultural solutions to the problem of intoxication that evolution could have taken advantage of it if it wanted to. So let's talk about the genetic one first. There is a set of two different mutations in uh, enzymes that have to do with the processing of alcohol in the body that lead to a syndrome that's sometimes called Asian flushing uh, syndrome because it's most common in East Asia. If you have this syndrome, a couple sips of alcohol, you, your face turns red, you start to flush, you feel nauseous. Drinking alcohol is very unpleasant if you have this, this genetic condition. If alcohol were just a costly mistake, this is the solution to the problem. This is awesome. It's actually so effective at helping with drinking that a chemical that reproduces the effects of this genetic syndrome is used to treat alcoholism because you just don't like to drink. So there is this genetic solution out there, and it's an ancient one. So it's estimated that this evolved seven to 10,000 years ago, somewhere around present-day Shanghai. But it just sits there. This is present distribution, focused around its origin, spread a little bit to Japan and Korea, but it's pretty much sat there. It's also very interesting that uh, analogous mutations causing the same effect have evolved at least twice independently, once in the Middle East and once in Europe, and also remain very confined to limited populations. So this is the silver bullet to the problem of our taste for alcohol, and yet it hasn't done anything. It hasn't spread very much. That suggests that there's, there's more to the story here than just some kind of evolutionary mistake. Let's talk about cultural evolution, which is very powerful. Cultural evolution can fix things very quickly. Um, it's very good at responding to new situations. How would cultural evolution deal with the problem of a mistaken taste for alcohol? Pretty easy, just tell people they can't drink. <laughs> Right? It's not, it's not rocket science. Um, so prohibition, we tend to think of prohibition in the American context. But again, anywhere there have been human beings who can write, we have records of prohibition. I mean, in ancient China, one of the earliest law statutes that we have decrees death to anyone who makes or consumes alcohol. It didn't work. <laughs> it was about as successful as American prohibition was. There are major world religions that are based on prohibition. One of their main uh, tenets is uh, abstaining from things that are intoxicating to the mind. So this, this solution culturally is out there. And yet, like that genetic solution, it just kind of sits there. So this is where alcohol is currently prohibited in, in part or in whole in the world. And it looks a lot like that genetic map. It, it didn't disappear. The solution maintains in our genetic and cultural repertoire, but it kind of sits there. It doesn't spread the way you would expect it to spread. If this was really only a problem, if there were only costs involved with alcohol, you would expect both this gene complex and this cultural idea of just prohibiting alcohol to spread very quickly, and it hasn't. 